You are listening to Intergenerational Politics with Jill Winebanks and Victor Shi, where we host weekly political discussions that are engaging and relevant to all generations with experts on various issues facing our country today. Hey, this is Victor Shi. I'm going to be an incoming freshman at UCLA, and I'm also the youngest Biden delegate here in <laughs> Illinois. Jill, I know a lot about you, but can you give our audience an, a brief introduction about who you are? Brief introduction is that I'm at the opposite end of the age spectrum of Victor as a delegate for Biden. And we have started this intergenerational podcast to bring you the views of people from all ends of the spectrum and to talk to very impressive people. Um, I was a Watergate prosecutor and I'm the author of The Watergate Girl, my memoir. Um, So I've done that and I've also worked besides in the Department of Justice in the Pentagon. Uh, during the Carter administration, for those of you old enough to remember President Carter. And I am now an MSNBC legal analyst. So with that, let's go ahead, Victor. Yeah, so as always, we want to thank you for listening to Intergenerational Politics. Today, we cannot be more excited to be talking with our special guest, Ambassador Wendy Sherman, about the recent revelations that Russia paid bounties to the Taliban to attack U.S. troops, as well as effective leadership in this critical moment in our history. Ambassador Sherman is a professor of the practice of public leadership and the director of the Center of Public Leadership at Harvard Kennedy School. Ambassador Sherman was the former counselor of the Department of State under Secretary Madeleine Albright, former special advisor to President Bill Clinton and policy coordinator on North Korea, assistant secretary for legislative affairs under Secretary Warren Christopher and former undersecretary of state of political affairs. Ambassador Sherman also led the U.S. negotiating team that reached an agreement on a joint comprehensive plan of action between the P5 plus one, the European Union, and Iran, which for many other diplomatic accomplishments, she was awarded the National Security Medal by President Barack Obama. Ambassador Sherman is currently an MSNBC Global Affairs contributor and on the USA Today board of contributors. Most recently and excitingly, Ambassador Sherman is the author of this new book, Not for the Fan of Heart, Lessons in Courage, Power, and Persistence, which is available in paperback edition today. So be sure to buy that. Um, Before I formally thank Ambassador Sherman for being here today, I just want to say I've always been a huge fan of yours, Ambassador Sherman. And last year, I began learning more about your work and listening to some of your foreign policy commentary on MSNBC. And so in 2019, in December of 2019, I went to Boston for this workshop I was helping leading it on my way back to Chicago, um, I was sitting at one of those like long countertop tables at the Boston Logan Airport. And as I was doing my homework, I quickly glanced to my left and didn't just see Representative Catherine Catherine Clark there. I also saw um, Ambassador Sherman standing there. And so immediately I had my dad um, stand up and take a picture of us since I was so shocked. But um, lastly, then fast forward to the beginning of 2020, I thought it would be a great idea to have Ambassador Wendy Sherman um, talk to some of our students at Stevenson High School, which is a student that um, I graduated, which is uh, the high school that I graduated from. And um, on March 17th, we planned for um, Ambassador Sherman to talk about effective leadership and the importance of youth voting. And um, of course, that Thursday before the Tuesday of March 17th, our school announced that we would go virtual for at least a month, which ended up canceling the event. So all to say, thank you so much for being here, Ambassador Sherman. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Well, I'm very thrilled to be here. It was great to meet you in Logan Airport. Mm-hmm. One knows what will happen. That was an intergenerational conversation too, because I also <laughs> had a conversation with Congresswoman Clark, mm-hmm. uh, who is uh, part of a leadership in the House of Representatives. And of course, who doesn't know Jill Weinbanks, uh, who is has helped us all navigate mm-hmm. so many difficult legal issues on MSNBC, author of a fabulous memoir, she points out. And You know, you mentioned President Carter and hard not to note that today he and Rosalind Carter will have been married 74 years. And they really really are so emblematic of what public service is supposed to be about. It's about being, you know, patriotic, uh, working hard for your country, working hard for equity in this country. And that is what they've always done. They probably have one of the most successful post-presidencies Uh, with everything they've done in Habitat uh, for housing for those who don't have a safe place to live, uh, working on mental health issues, on health issues, uh, and who isn't an admirer of the president who has been so challenged with one illness after another and always is there on Sunday to teach his Sunday Mm -hmm. school class. So 
Uh, great. He, he was an amazing person. He remains an amazing, amazing person. His son actually lives in my home. Uh, I'm not sure he's still here, but his son was married in Evanston. Wow. And um, Sarah Weddington, who also served in the Carter administration, and I went to a party for the bride and groom. So I've been able wow. to stay a little bit in touch, not as much as, of course, I would have liked to. Um, I also have a connection to Warren Christopher, who you were with. Um, he, I, I was general counsel of the Army, which meant I was also general counsel of the Panama Canal Corporation oh, of course. during the <laughs> negotiations wow. and got to work with him on the negotiations. Wow. And my secretary from the Pentagon, who had worked for me during Watergate, came with me to Freed Frank, um, the law firm I went to right after Watergate, and then to the Pentagon with me. When I moved back to Chicago to get married and live here forever, um, she went to work for Warren Christopher. So she met him through the Pentagon the dealings we had. So it's sort of like there's so many things. Um, and at the end of this um, conversation, I do want to get to some of the similarities in mm -hmm. your strange career path to where <laughs> you are um, from social worker to ambassador. It's mm -hmm. quite a wonderful story. And I, I think that particularly Victor's colleagues will be able to benefit from Mm -hmm. how you can make those kinds of changes that you don't have to decide today what you're going to do for the rest of your life if you're willing to take a chance. But I want to start with uh, the Russian bounty, and there's so many things we want to cover with you. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, at least uh, 10 days ago, we all publicly learned that there was significant evidence that the Russians were paying the Taliban to kill our troops. Uh, horrible thing that you would think would have alarmed all members of the government currently serving, that they would have wanted to take action. Um, the president says it's a hoax. The president says he was never told about it, even though it was, of course, in his uh, daily presidential briefing. Uh, we know he doesn't always read it. Uh, and there, it's possible that the briefer was afraid to tell him something he didn't want to know about his good friend Putin and maybe didn't tell him, but it is his job to read the daily briefing. And so what I want to start with is sort of very simple, but just sort of what are the facts that would make us believe that the Russians were paying bounty? What, what facts have come out that our listeners should know about? Could you start with that? Sure. So here are some things that listeners should know. No intelligence report is perfect. There's virtually no intelligence report that has in it that gold nugget of information that makes you absolutely certain you've got it uh, absolutely right. It's not exactly like we see in TV and movies. Usually the intelligence community says they have low confidence medium confidence or high confidence in an assessment. And that assessment is made up of lots of bits of information. In this case, there appear to be some financial transactions. There may be some human intelligence. That means somebody who heard something. Um, there may or may not be what's called signals intelligence, which is where we overhear a conversation. Uh, we do overhead satellites. Sometimes we see something visually. Now a lot of people can see it through uh, public uh, corporate satellites that can see things and have high resolution. Uh, it may be because we see a piece of information here and a piece of information here and we begin to connect the dots. Uh, something that was very apparent after the fact in 9-11 but wasn't at the time of 9-11, all of those dots and connecting them. So what we know from this intelligence is that uh, a combination of different kinds of intelligence, including financial transactions, led the intelligence community to think this was important enough to, like, in all likelihood, put in the president's daily brief. And as you wisely pointed out, Jill, we know, and we know from Beth Sanner, the president's senior briefer, who in a set of remarks the other day, basically without talking about Trump specifically said, you have to know your audience. Sometimes you bring visuals. Sometimes you just give a nugget of information. Sometimes you know what they want to hear and what they don't want to hear. And I don't think there's anybody left in the White House who doesn't understand that the president doesn't want to hear bad news where Russia and Vladimir Putin are concerned. So 
those are the facts. There is a great article that was just out today in op-ed in the Washington Post by three fantastic intelligence professionals um, in both Democrat and Republican administrations, Michael Leiter, uh, Michael Hayden, uh, and Robert Cardillo, basically explaining how intelligence is put together and how there's never something that is just, you know, like we see in the TV and the movies, it really happens. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is a difference between whether you present it visually, whether you use graphs, whether you use pictures, and whether you withhold it completely. And withholding that information, although it was clearly in the briefing so that he had it available to him, is a very different thing than deciding how to present it and when to present it. And it's, it's certainly distressing. But we do know that at least for the last more than 10 days, he has known about it because it's been public. And so I wanna talk about what could he have done? What should he have done? We also have reporting that the one thing he did do was start an investigation of who leaked the information as opposed to investigating the truth of the information in it and the danger, the possibility as we've now heard that at least three Marines were killed as a result of the bounties paid by the Russians. That's something that those families will have to live with forever, that this country has to live with forever. But what could have and should have the president have done now that this information is public and he can't avoid saying, well, I didn't know about it. Well, first of all, Robert O'Brien, who is his national security advisor, should have walked into the Oval Office, as we heard Susan Rice discuss on Rachel Maddow the other evening, and said, Mr. President, I know this didn't get briefed to you if it didn't. I know perhaps you didn't get to the PDB today, but you need to know this is a very serious matter. American lives are at risk. Uh, and then uh, what you would hope is that Mr. O'Brien would have called a meeting of the principals, those are all the cabinet secretaries relevant to this issue, including the agencies like the CIA and, and the director of national intelligence officer, uh, and bring them into the situation room and say, okay, here's the situation we have. I want you all to put together a set of options for the president. Those options could be everything from more sanctions on Russia, uh, it could be uh, really disinviting uh, Vladimir Putin to the G7. It was just astonishing that the president, not only during a time when he in all likelihood knew, and certainly the people around him knew, that uh, these bounties had been placed by the Russians uh, with the Taliban on American troops and on our uh, ally troops, um, that indeed, uh, the president invited Vladimir Putin to the G7, just astonishing and outrageous, quite frankly, and play six phone calls to Putin during this time, also outrageous, uh, without condemning what had happened, taking actions. What were the force protection plans for our troops? What did he ask of Secretary of Defense Esper and General Milley, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, about what our force protection plans were? what actions we could take regarding the Taliban, if any, what we were doing diplomatically uh, with the Afghan government to further protect our troops, uh, let alone punish Russia. And as you pointed out, Jill, one of the most horrible things in this instance is there were no condolences for the families of those officers, of those troops killed in Afghanistan. Not only will the families have to live with this tragedy forever, but they will have to live with the fact that the President of the United States not only didn't do anything about it, but lauded Vladimir Putin and didn't show any empathy whatsoever for their loss. You know, having worked in the Pentagon and having a great affinity and respect for the military, that to me is a tragedy beyond tragedies. And it's, I could also remember something listening to you. When I first got to the Pentagon, the Army intelligence suddenly decided that um, there was greater troop strength in North Korea than had been previously believed. And that was in response to President Carter announcing that he wanted to start withdrawing troops from Korea. And, but he didn't ignore that advice. He actually sent me 
to go and investigate the intelligence reports, to look at the overhead surveillance that we had, to look at the pictures, to talk to our soldiers on the ground as to whether it was true. And that's something that President Trump didn't do. He hasn't asked, is this true? Are our troops in danger? Don't I, as commander in chief, have an obligation to protect the troops? So I, I think what you're saying is just, it, it's so distressing. And I'm hoping um, that we will get to a point where someone will investigate this. Um, I do have a lot more questions about Russia, but I think before we run out of time, Victor has some questions on a different subject. And so let's move on to those, I think. Yeah, so I mean, so I guess relating this back to my generation, like more recently, there was a referendum in Russia, um, which by the way, the results aren't official yet, that essentially says Vladimir Putin can remain in power until 2036, a year in which he'll be 84 years old. Clearly, I think Putin is doing something strategic here as he's now basically present for life in Russia. Um, so for our younger generation out there, some of us faintly remember 2016 when Russia unequivocally interfered with our election. Um, so for 2020, can you discuss how Trump's coziness, co coziness with Vladimir Putin doesn't just impact international policies, but also domestic policies, and why our younger people should pay attention to this issue? Uh, thank you for that question, Victor. And let me start by saying everybody who is listening to this, whatever your beliefs, whoever you're going to vote for, register and vote. I live in Massachusetts now, and Governor Charlie Baker, who is a Republican, just signed legislation uh, that will allow every single member of Massachusetts who is registered to vote, to vote by mail should we choose to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is an issue of patriotism. This is an issue of civic responsibility and citizenship. So everybody listening, register, vote, and make sure that everybody around you, all your friends, all your family are registered and vote as well. And if you don't have a mail-in option in your state, organize. You all are fantastic at organizing. I teach at Harvard Kennedy School. I know how well students can organize. Uh, like uh, Jill, perhaps, I came of political age in the late 60s and I took to the streets uh, and protested both civil rights, women's rights against the Vietnam War. So I am just, in awe of what young people are doing today to make their voices heard, but it's really important to make your voices heard on November 3rd at the ballot box. So where Putin is concerned, one of the things that is of great concern to me is there is no all of government effort to deal with disinformation by the Russians, by the Chinese, by the Iranians, by the North Koreans, by anybody who wants to get in the middle of our election process. Uh, and that concerns me for a number of reasons. One, we know that on all of the social media, which is how your generation, and more and more my generation, is learning how to operate on, we know that tons of propaganda can be put on there. Lots of bots, lots of false flags. Uh, you don't know where the information comes from. You don't know if it's legitimate, but we all take it in because we sort of scroll through Twitter, we scroll through Facebook, so people have to become good consumers of social media and really question what they're reading, find another source for it, see what's going on. Uh, Russia is probably, and China, secondly, the greatest concern for disinformation coming into the 2020 campaign. Mm -hmm. That disinformation matters in another way, and it is to ensure the legitimacy of the election. And I know Jill has spent a lot of her life making sure that we don't have voter suppression at the polls, along with all the legal sisterhood of MSNBC <laughs> yes. in law, uh, that uh, we don't have suppression at the voting booth, but we also make sure we have legitimate elections so that if at the end of this election, uh, Putin trying to help Trump says, well, actually, the mail-in ballots came from us, it gives Trump a basis for saying that it wasn't a legitimate election. And I think that Trump will try to find a basis for saying this is an illegitimate election. Mm -hmm. So it's quite critical that we all be very thoughtful consumers. We make sure that our states have good voting processes, that we have lawyers from both parties uh, that are part of the monitoring process for our elections, uh, and make sure that we have what we know we will have 
which is a legitimate election. We know that mail-in ballots, which have been done by lots of state, have not been filled with fraud. They have been quite legitimate elections, and we all need to do our part to make sure that continues. Definitely. Yeah. And just like you said, um, it's up to us, the, young, the younger generation, to really make our voices heard in this election and um, vote, vote, vote. Um, so I guess now moving just on once. to... Yeah. You can only vote once. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> emphasis on voting, yes. Um, I'm from Chicago where we vote early and often. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but today's also an exciting day for Ambassador Sherman with her new book, Not for the Fan of Heart, Lessons in Courage, Power and Persistent, coming out in paperback edition. And um, you and Jill have many similarities, so I'll hand it back off to Jill to talk about your new book and um, ask you a few questions. Yes, it's a wonderful new book, and not new book, and it's newly released as a paperback, um, which makes it available to everybody today. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have so many things in common, we could spend the next two hours just <laughs> talking about similarities. Um, I noticed you talk about being the only woman in the room, which was often my situation. Um, and you talk about what it takes to be a leader, but I really wanna focus on how you have taken your education in social work to end up in the areas of specialty that you have in national security, nuclear, all of those things, which is <laughs> such a remarkable transition and um, I know what I went through to go from being, my dream was to be a journalist, but because I was a girl, as we were called in those era, um, I was offered jobs on the woman's page. So I went to law school to be a real reporter and then somehow thought, oh, well, I just paid for law school, I should use it, and ended up practicing law until you know, 40 years later, I'm now a journalist. Um, so it's been an exciting transition and in between I went into corporate business, which is something I never thought I would do. And I know how I marketed myself by changing the stress of what I had done in various jobs. And I, I think that's important for uh, Victor's friends to know is how do they take whatever they choose today to study and end up being available to take the risks of trying something completely different that they think might serve the public, and also about the importance of public service as one of the components of that. So if you could talk a little about that, I think it would be really interesting. Sure. Um, you know, I was in Washington, perfectly happy, uh, uh, being part of a um, company that I started that does global consulting around the world um, that is called the Albright Stonebridge Group and doing MSNBC and working on my book at the time uh, and got a call. Uh, would I come to talk with the Kennedy School about succeeding David Gergen as the director of the Center for Public Leadership? Mm. And at the end of the day, my husband and I decided to do it. Uh, we had an extra little incentive because our daughter, who's a lawyer, Jill, uh, teaches immigration law at Boston University and helps to run the Immigration Asylum and Human Trafficking Clinic and our two little grandsons are here. Oh, uh, wow. uh, I came here because there is nothing more important today than making sure that Victor, you and your friends and colleagues understand how important it is to have principled, effective, just public leaders. And that public leadership can be done in government, of course. It can be done in non-governmental organizations in civil society. It can be done as a journalist. It can be done as a lawyer. It can be done even in private business if you bring public value to the work that you do in private business. So I talk to people your age all the time. You're about to go to undergraduate. I teach mm -hmm. largely graduates, so some mm -hmm. undergraduates. And what I say to you all is I wish you an unexpected life. Uh, <laughs> yes. so, uh, get a core set of skills for me those core set of skills was as a social worker. Uh, my training is as a community organizer, how you decide on an objective, put a strategy together, understand all the stakeholders, the politics, the press, the communications, and drive to an objective. And I learned clinical skills, which I only half jokingly said are very valuable for dictators and members of Congress. <laughs> Uh, and I've applied those first as director of child welfare when I was only 30 years old in the state of Maryland, and then found my way to Capitol Hill 
uh, because of a friendship with then Congresswoman Barbara Mikulski. Then I ran her first successful campaign for the US Senate. Then I did a lot of presidential politics. And then I got a call one night, would I come and meet Warren Christopher? I could not imagine what Warren Christopher wanted me for. By then I was a partner in a democratic media consulting firm making political ads for candidates. So I went and saw Christopher and by the end of the meeting, he was recommending to Bill Clinton that Clinton nominate me to be the Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs. Mm. Not because I knew everything there was to know about national security, I, I didn't at the time. I knew a fair amount, but not, I wasn't a, an expert by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but because I knew Washington and I knew politics. And I've been doing national security and foreign policy ever since, both first for Warren Christopher, then for Madeleine Albright, then Madeline, myself, Carol Browner, Susie George, and a great guy who put up with four strong women, Jim O'Brien, put together a global consulting firm called the Albright Group. I did that for a decade before I went back into government as the undersecretary, first under Hillary Clinton, and then under John Kerry. Uh, and now I find myself here uh, at uh, Harvard Kennedy School. So get a core set of skills and then be able to translate those skills into different areas. And then the last point I'll make is take risks. Be ready to jump on board. The worst that can happen is that you fail. I've taken on a couple of jobs and I knew almost as soon as I took them, it was gonna be a doozy. It was gonna be a bad <laughs> fit. It just wasn't gonna work. It took me maybe a year to extricate myself so I didn't burn every bridge on the way out. Uh, but, you know, you learn as you go through life that you generally will come out the other side. So it's worth risk. And all of you very successful young people, people like you, Victor, who have just done so well so early in life, often stop taking risks because you feel like you've made it. But you keep taking risks. Um, it got Jill uh, onto the Watergate uh, team. Uh, which was just extraordinary at such a young age. Um, and it's, it's important to keep on reaching uh, for the next thing. I, that is such great advice mm -hmm. on all aspects of that. And it is sometimes, uh, you know, I can relate to when Carter was elected, I had offers for three different jobs. And the biggest stretch for me was at the Pentagon. I had been an anti-Vietnam War activist I honestly wouldn't have recognized a general's insignia at, or anybody lesser than that. Uh, generals are easy because they're stars. Um, but I thought this is the most interesting way to learn something and to really get involved. And I didn't even realize how much foreign policy was involved in the Pentagon. Um, and it was the most exciting, wonderful job. I met some of the very best people. The Secretary of the Army was extraordinary, Clifford Alexander. Mm -hmm. um, but the generals were phenomenal people. And it changed my attitude toward the military. So I would share the same advice in terms of just think about the core skills. Think about your critical thinking ability, because that's really, the, to me, the key skill. But the last thing I want to ask you is you are wearing a pin, and I am... Um, a huge collector of pins, and I'm known for my hashtag Jill's Pins. Uh, I'm wearing a Russian pin today. It's a, as you can see, a picture of um, the Russian onion domes. And um, your pin is very special. So I want to hear about your pin. Please tell us. Yeah. Um, this pin uh, was made by Anne Hand, who is a Washington, D.C., um, really legend. Uh, and she makes pins for all kinds of events. Uh, this one was given to me by uh, about to be Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. I helped her transition into the State Department. I'm in awe of what she's done with her life. Um, I just wrote an op-ed that was in The Hill about what a rough and tough road it has been for women to get into the White House, uh, to get into anything for that matter, as you mm -hmm. point out, yeah. mm -hmm. um, And um, I'm just in awe of what she's done. And uh, obviously, I'm a Democrat. I hope that Joe Biden gets elected, but I want everybody to be involved, no matter who you're for. Uh, and um, 
he's going to have a woman VP. Uh, and that will be mind boggling. Shirley Chisholm, uh, who was the first African American woman elected to Congress uh, and the first to run for president in 1972. Uh, she only got into Congress in 1968, uh, really started down this road. And we are celebrating the centennial of the suffragettes. And uh, there is a great PBS documentary running now about that history. Uh, and so this is to salute uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, all that she has done and when that woman enters the White House uh, in January, it will be because of Chisholm and Clinton and Ferro, even Palin, uh, who uh, really started down that road. I also want to say, as you and I are reflecting on so much history, that one of the challenges for us is to listen to Victor and to listen to young people. Um, and I try to listen to my students as much as I want them to listen to me because your experience is different. Uh, you're at a different time. You approach the world differently. You help to keep me honest about things, challenge me all of the time, sometimes in ways I don't want to be challenged, but it's really important. And that's why I think this intergenerational dialogue that you, Victor, and you, Jill, are having is so important because we, we generations have to listen to each other if we want to ensure the future that the younger generation deserves and is fighting for. Yeah, well, I'm I can't so, think of a better yeah. ending to this than listening to what you That's just right. said. It's perfect. Thank you so much for being part of this. Thank uh, you, yeah. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. And I know for me, like, I'm so grateful to be working with Jill and having this conversation with you, Ambassador Sherman, and having these people to look up to and um, learn from. So I know that this conversation was definitely one of my favorites and um, we are so appreciative. So to close off this conversation, we hope that you listening also enjoy this episode. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook and send suggestions, ideas for future topics and speakers you'd like to see via Jill, myself, or our website. Lastly, Intergenerational Politics is now on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, so be sure to subscribe and rate our channel to support us. So Ambassador Sherman, once again, thank you so much and best of luck with everything that you do. Thank you, and we hope you'll join us again. This was fabulous. Thank yeah. you.